just take that off for a second. Okay, so uh, I wanted to create this recording because one issue that I've run into in trying to make the classes of Intro to Neuro, COGS 104, and Cognitive Neuroscience, COGS 320, different is that I've tried to make it so that information is not heavily overlapping. So some of you have had me or another professor for Intro to Neuro before, and I didn't want to basically have a full recap on certain topics. For a lot of the previous topics, I've been able to switch things up a lot. And that way people are kind of getting a little bit more breath if they have had the course sort of material before. One issue that arises is when there is a particular system that I've already described a lot in the previous class. So one case in point would be how visual sensation or vision for short works. And so my idea was to do a recorded lecture on this so that some people who've already seen a lot of this before are going to have a refresher plus a few new things. And then for other people who haven't seen it before that I can encapsulate it and go over it in uh, sufficient detail as well. And so each group of students that fall into either category can basically peruse through this lecture at their own speed. Normally I would try to do this in person too, but also I'm kind of looking at the scheduling for the rest of the semester and I do have concerns about getting to all the topics I want to. So all that out of the way, uh, I will be giving you these slides shortly, but we are going to take a little browsing into how vision works. So even if some of you have had uh, some teaching about how visual sensation works before, I do have some new components that I would not have delved into in the intro class, specifically regarding things like retinal ganglion cells. So uh, do be aware of things like that. Uh, beyond that, let's go ahead and get started. So, starting up at the top, we have vision, and we can call this visual sensation. The reason why I make this distinction is because another segment of this course talks about visual perception. Now, vision, um, vision we spend an insane amount of time on in any sort of uh, cognitive, perceptual, neuroscience kind of course. And that's because we are very visual creatures and because there is an extensive amount of processing we do in order to get visual information, far more than what we have going on for the other senses. This is not to belittle the other senses and their complexity, but vision is just so gosh darn complex by itself. And if we were to spend the full amount of time on it, even without having any sort of side readings and discussions, it would be still like uh, at least three class periods. Um, if I were to use all the slides that I had made for this, it would have totaled to about 70 slides. I, I pared things down. <laughs> that number probably seems staggering to you as much as it was to me. I pared things down a lot for each of these segments. So we're gonna just focus on the important stuff and not a lot of extraneous details, just so we could kind of move on and talk about other things besides vision in class. For any other information you want to talk about, feel free to always ask. Let's get started. So taking a step back, we haven't really talked about the senses too much yet. I've alluded to some things in other chapters before, but let's start out by thinking about what sensory receptors actually are. And so each of the senses has its own type of receptor. For taste and smell, we have these things called chemoreceptors. And as per the name, they are just chemical detectors. What makes them similar to neurotransmitter receptors is that they are receptors that just get activated when something binds to them directly. And so with neurotransmitter receptors, something like a glutamate receptor waits until glutamate <coughs> comes along, binds to it, opens it up, and then it's good to go. In the case of chemical receptors, like those on the tongue, uh, salt, sodium, will bind to a salty receptor and activate it and depolarize the taste receptor, and there you go. Mechanoreceptors exist for a few other senses. We have this involved with touch, 
hearing as well as balance. And these are basically just uh, as per the name, mechano sensing receptors, meaning that they, they gauge mechanical force. And they do this because the actual ion channels stretch open or smush shut based on that force. So unlike other things that tend to be a chemical interaction that we've talked about on that small scale, sub microscopic scale so far, these receptors actually just kind of are forced open with physical force on that microscopic level. The thing that we'll be seeing in today's talk are photoreceptors, which we could think of as just light detectors, but perhaps more complicated than this, just that term allows for us to see, no pun intended. So there were a few ideas we've talked about earlier on the course, and these have to do with the way that neurons firing, AKA giving an action potential, that would be a neuron firing once or turning on once. One action potential is a neuron activating one time. If we were to graph action potentials over time, they might look like these vertical dashes that we see next to where it says APs. And so more vertical dashes means that it fires more often in a set span of time. In this diagram here, we have two phenomena that we can look at. Now, a lot of senses have it working this way where the rate of firing that a neuron gives off has something to do with the intensity of the stimulus. And this is called rate coding. And so basically, if a stimulus is like small, or of low intensity, then the detecting cell, the detecting receptor, detecting neuron, whatever, is going to fire eh, sometimes, not super frequently. If it is something that is very intense stimulus, then the neuron is going to fire a ton in response to that stimulus. So the rate of firing translates to the brain how intense the stimulus is. There is a different perspective. And that's illustrated by the bottom part of this diagram, labeled line coding, which is basically saying that there are dedicated lines of code or communication that are forwarding the information up. So some sort of example of labeled line coding, although overly simplified, would be if we have um, photoreceptors that only responded to red, then they would activate to red. And if they were shown something green, then they would not activate it. If it was vice versa and we had a green stimulus, then the red receptors would not activate, the green receptors would activate. So basically things are segregated into these different lines of communication. So the type of stimulus is figured out by only certain receptors responding to it. This is not too different to how neurotransmitter receptors might work on a chemical manner, because we know glutamate receptors don't activate if GABA is around. GABA receptors don't activate when glutamate's around. Same thing with dopamine. Dopamine receptors, sorry, dopamine does not activate a glutamate receptor. These receptors are specific for a chemical, a lock and key type mechanism, where a key doesn't fit into all locks, and a lock only really looks for one type of key. Now, one tricky thing is that we've already seen some cases where receptors actually do not only respond to an ideal stimulus. I've given some examples earlier on in the course. So if you are having trouble trying to remember those, I suggest you take a moment to sort of either think back or look through your notes to see some examples. We will have some later in this slide set, but um, these other examples, uh, we will revisit if you can't happen to remember. So given the examples I have here of rate coding, and labeled line coding. When we think about the photoreceptors in the eyes, which do you think they use? So write down your answer for now to be discussed later. So this is a brief once over about how the eye itself is laid out. I'm not too concerned with the nomenclature, like the names of all the parts of the eye. I will just emphasize the things that I find most important. So like a lot of other diagrams in this class, we're not gonna worry about all the particular parts and pieces, except for the particular ones I emphasize. So when we have the process of sensing light, different per from perception, that'll come later, uh, light detection, light sensation 
happens in the eye, in this layer of tissue called the retina. The retina is located in the back cup of the eye, so back half of the eye. If we were to split the eye into a front half and a back half, the retina would coat the back half roughly. And so that's where the photoreceptors exist, inside this layer of tissue called the retina. And inside this retina, there are different spots that we could pick. So we could take the retina and um, just to kind of give an example of what I mean, we could take the retina and imagine that we have the retina cup like this inside of rock. This is across, this is us after we cut off the front of the eye. We have the back of the eye. We're taking a look in the inside of it. It's cupped kind of like, sorry, kind of like this. And then um, if we were to pancake it out, then we'd have a center point where the light falls. And then we have the periphery where all the other stuff um, all to the side of our vision falls. So basically, whatever our eyes are looking directly at hits the center point here. And then whatever is happening all the way off to the side of our vision, things that we can barely see out of the corner of our eye, that is where the light's hitting all the way off to the very edge of the retina. So the center point we call the fovea. So again, that's wherever our eye is looking directly, it's falling on the center point of the retina, the fovea, our, our center of field of view. If something's going into the periphery, that's toward the edges of the retina. As far as signals go, the retina is a piece of tissue that has a lot of neuron-like structures, nerve-like structures in it. And the information that comes out of the retina gets funneled through the optic nerve, which by this point we've seen in the sheep brain lab, through the optic chiasm, the crossover of the optic nerves, again, another sheep brain lab reminder, the optic tract, yet another thing we saw in the sheep brain lab, the optic tract forwards that communication to the lateral geniculate nucleus, which we'll see spelled out in later slides, uh, LGN for short. And again, seen in the sheep brain lab. And the LGN finally forwards it up to the occipital lobe where we start actually putting things together. So there's a lot of in-between steps that it stops off at uh, on its way up to the visual brain, as you will. There's a little caveat to things. Um, there is a spot where it, it, the layout's a little strange. So let me see if it actually is illustrated in the next slide's diagram. Yes. So the layout's a little strange. Um, there is a spot where the retina doesn't have any photoreceptors. So basically, there's like a gap in what it can visually detect. And so we see in this diagram, the fovea, the spot where it's like wherever the eye is looking directly at, and it says optic nerve and blind spot. So the retina is laid out in this really weird way where the, when we're looking at the layer, let's take a look at this cross section. It's blown up over here, the white arrow, we follow that, and we go over here. We see rods and cones, bipolar cells, endocrine, horizontal, all the intermediate stuff, and then ganglion cells. From these yellow ganglion cells, these funnel all of their, uh, their sending nerves, their axons, to the optic nerve, or they form the optic nerve. Now, let's, let's take a second to think about this. The deepest part, the one that's like closest towards the brain, towards the inner part, the deepest part are the actual photodetectors. These rods and cones are what actually activate to the light. light. And then the stuff that forwards it to the brain is on the outer parts. And that seems very backwards because that's exactly how it's laid out in a very weird way. So instead of the photoreceptors being the first layer of cells that the light will hit, the light actually has to shine through these other layers of cells first before they get to the things that can actually pick up the light and respond to it. So in other words, light is shining through the ganglion cells, through all these intermediate cells before it gets to the photoreceptors being the cones and rods. And so this starts to put together the idea of why, why we have a gap in our vision, because laid out backwards like this, now we have all these axons going through from the retina 
and they all have to basically shove straight through the back of the eye. So there can't be room for photoreceptors anymore because all the axons are bundling and going through that whole spot. There's no place to put the photoreceptors anymore in where the optic nerve exists. So that's part of why we have a blind spot. What do we mean by a blind spot? It means we literally do not have light information being detected there. Now, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but just to preface it, when we think about the fact that we don't have a spot in our eye that we actually see things in, we're not really aware of it. That's something the brain takes care of. So we don't have like a black dot on the edge of our vision um, of one side of each eye. It's filled in by the brain in a very covert way that we're not aware of. And that just kind of shows what the brain is doing behind the scenes. For now though, if we're just looking solely at the eye, there would basically be a black spot of nothing in what the eye is picking up. And that is where the optic nerve is going through. Let's talk about the photoreceptors and what they're actually doing. Although this gets a little bit complicated as far as what we have in the diagram here, this is a simplified version. So, so bear with me if this is relatively new for you. The way that photoreceptors work is that they're actually always activating and sending out their neurotransmitters in darkness. So that means that when there isn't light, the photoreceptors are constantly active, constantly sending out their chemical messages to the next cell in the retina. And that seems a bit weird because the alternative is that when light is shined on these photoreceptors, that means that they are um, hyperpolarized rather than depolarized. So neurons, they're usually depolarized and that turns them on. When light is shined onto them, they stop their action potentials or well, their, their changes, their depolarizations. And this stops the release of neurotransmitters. So yeah, it gets a bit strange because you'd figure, well, shouldn't light activate them? No, it's actually the reverse. They are active in darkness and they become less and less active the brighter the light gets. This relates to that whole idea of rate coding just in reverse of what you would expect. So we call this uh, whole idea dark current because current is when there's electrical flow happening. So depolarization, the, the receptor turning on effectively. And dark, because it's happening in the dark. So dark electrical flow. How this is happening is when light, uh, well, during the normal circumstance in darkness, sodium is always going into the photoreceptor. Uh, we see inflow of sodium and a plus dark current, what I described before. So sodium is constantly coming in constantly telling this receptor to depolarize, constantly telling it releases neurotransmitters. When light comes along, it activates this thing called rhodopsin. And rhodopsin, uh, it, it, through a few other intermediate steps, will activate another enzyme that cleaves up this thing called CGMP. So we're not gonna get too concerned with like exactly what these mean, but you can think of CGMP as the gatekeeper that is holding the sodium channel open. So uh, the doorman, for, for perhaps a uh, better uh, analogy, the doorman's there, keeping the sodium channel open. And then um, light comes in, activates a signal cascade, which causes this doorman to disappear, to vanish, to dissolve, let's say. And if that doorman's not there to hold the door open, then door closes. Sodium channel is closed. Sodium can't get in. Neuron stops depolarizing. If it stops depolarizing, that means it doesn't continue to release neurotransmitters. So that's the setup of what's happening when the photoreceptor is exposed to light, that we have this door being snapped shut and there is an absence of signal when light is ramped up. So getting beyond some of the particulars of the how photoreceptors work, let's talk a little bit more about characteristics of them. Because I mentioned these terms, rods and cones. And they're called such because they're actually those shapes. They're shaped either rod-like or cone-like. Now rods, um, one factor about them is that they have low resolution. 
So if we think of monitors on computers from like 10 to 20 years ago, that would be an example of something that's low resolution. When nowadays people are talking about viewing things in 4K, that would be high resolution. Uh, low resolution is kind of like a really grainy old laptop or desktop. Cones are the ones that do allow for high resolution. Rods, they don't perceive color. They just kind of are responsive to one range. Cones have a whole bunch of different ranges, and we'll see more about that in a bit. Uh, we classify them based on what their ideal response color is. So blue cones respond best to a certain shade of blue. Green cones respond best to a certain uh, shade of green. And red cones, they're called red. They're not quite best responsive to red per se, but they're separate enough from green that we just call them a different cone. You'll see what the overlap looks like in coming slides. The trade-off of rods being low resolution and not seeing color is that they're actually also really sensitive. So if you are trying to find your way around a very dark room where there's just a tiny bit of light, your eyes will adapt and you will use rods in order to find your way around. The rods are not concerned with exact form and color, but they will help you find out general outlines and even motion of objects, including yourself, in the room. In normal lighting conditions, like what you're viewing this at right now, you will not be using your rods. So in most conditions where it's not dark in a room, we are not using rods. We are instead using cones because rods get easily oversaturated, overexposed, over inundated by signals with normal lighting. Cones, in contrast, they are not very sensitive. They need a lot of light to work. And so this is part of the reason why trying to see color in very dim or dark areas is not so great. The way that they have this sensitivity trade-off is that several rods will talk to one retinal ganglion cell. So those ganglion cells you saw from a few slides back that form the optic nerve, those are collecting signals from photoreceptors. And in the case of rods, it can be something like 10 to 20 different rods that all funnel down and get this one ganglion cell to fire. So basically, if any number of them are turning on, then it can get the ganglion cell to activate. With cones, it ends up being a much lower ratio. I don't think it's too often that it's a one-to-one -one ratio, but it might be something more like three cones for one ganglion cell, meaning that if none of the three cones are activated, then we miss whatever was going on. We miss whatever the, the light signal was and the ganglion cell does not send that information to the brain. So this is a sort of like sensitivity versus resolution pay, um, trade off. Now, imagine that pancaking example again with the eye. So just for reference, we take the retina, sort of cup shape, and we flatten it out to be completely flat. We have the center point, and then we have the periphery. Now, normally when it's cup shaped like this, if we're trying to track like, okay, light's coming in here versus here versus here versus here, we're more concerned with not the distance from center around this sort of curve, but instead the angle that the light is coming in. It's basically kind of coming out to be the same thing though. Like, okay, when the light hits this part, how distant is that from here, here, and here? We just happen to measure it in degrees rather than like something like a length measurement, like inches, millimeters, or something like that. So we'll just say that degrees and length are kind of the same thing for our purposes here in the next slide. Now imagine again, we pancake it out. And so zero degrees would be center. Uh, 80 degrees would be somewhere out here. And then 40 degrees would be somewhere like off to like middle side of one a part of the eye. So zero in the center, 40 degrees, 80 degrees. And then same 40 degrees this way, 80 degrees that way. And kick it out. And that is how we get the diagram here. So in this diagram, on the x-axis is our pancaked out eye. And again, zero point is where it's the fovea of our eye, what we're looking directly at in our vision. And all the way at the edges, 80 or 70 degrees out, that's pretty much the edges of what we end up seeing in the eye. 
where the edges of the retina exist. We have a lot going on here. Um, there is on the y-axis the number of receptors per square millimeter. So basically we're looking at the density of how many of these photoreceptors exist in any given part of the eye as we move from the center of the eye off toward the edges. Now, if we're going from left to right on the eye, we'll see that a few different things change. Let's first follow along with what's happening with the cones, the shaded region here. In the cone situation, we have the most cones, the most densely packed uh, situation of them, right in the fovea of the eye. And that makes sense because whatever we're looking directly at, we want to see with the highest detail. But it's interesting because also things that are off to the side of this, we don't see in quite as high resolution. Now, there is an interesting thing to consider. Uh, hold on a second. Yeah, I don't have the question explicitly here, but something, something to, to answer and something to bring up in class after this is, okay, so we see the cones are not just only in the fovea. We see that they, they taper down really quickly. So they go from this really dense spike here, and then that quickly descends off where we have minimal amount of cones in the rest of the eye, but it's not zero here doesn't ever actually reach zero. So what sort of, what sort of um, evidence from our own personal experience do we have that we still uh, have cones outside of our, the center of our view? In other words, how do we know that our cones exist and are being used off to the very edges of our vision? Think about what the cones do to answer that question. Next thing, rods we notice that those aren't found in the center. We could think of the cones crowding them out so there's no room for them in the fovea. But as soon as we step away from the fovea, we see a sudden increase in their concentration and they drop off very slowly compared to the cone situation. So even at the edges of the retina, they're not like super concentrated, but they're not also super low concentration either. So the trick that we have here as well is that if we are trying to see something in extremely low light conditions, let's say it's the night sky and um, we're trying to see a very dim star or something like that, we don't look directly at the star to see it. Instead, we look maybe 10 to 20 degrees away from what is directly at the star and we'll actually be able to see it a little bit better. So if we look directly at it, because this is low sensitivity, we might not see it directly there. We'll actually be able to see it using the strength or the combined power of all the rods being slightly off center there. Ask me if you are uh, confused by any of this. I'm very willing to give a recap on it. Okay, so we know that we have good um, low light sensitiveness in the other parts of the eye as we go away from the center point. And then we have the blind spot, as I mentioned, where we have the optic nerve basically punching through the back of the eye. We have no room for photoreceptors. And so we have this blind spot here. One of the exercises that we're going to do in the lab class is that we'll actually see where your blind spot is and how big it is, because it does vary from person to person. And for some of you, it actually might vary between one eye versus the other. It's not going to be perfectly symmetrical. So we go from photoreceptors. We kind of skipped over some of the intermediate cells like amacrine and bipolar cells and things like that. I'm not so concerned about spending a bunch of time with those. And then we go on to the retinal ganglion cells, or ganglion cells for short, that send their information to the optic nerve. All right, so what these retinal ganglion cells do is that they'll collect signals from rods and or cones, as well as taking that information when it's funneled through all the intermediate cells that we're not gonna concern ourselves with. One weird thing that they do is that they don't just take all the signals in equally. They will have these things called receptive fields in vision. So 
they will have a receptive field formed by maybe, in this case, there are three cones, let's say. And if light shines just on the center cone, that will have a different effect than if light shines on the surround cones here, the two side cones. So if light's shining on the center cone, then that's supposed to eventually activate the ganglion cell. Uh, if light is shining only on the surrounding parts here and here, and then there's a gap in the center, then it gives the opposite effect. It turns off the ganglion cell. And so ganglion cells, based on taking information and funneling it in from multiple photoreceptors, will make a decision about this whole center versus surround receptive field. And you'll see why it's arranged like this in a bit. It might seem kind of like a weird thing. It's like, why go to all the trouble setting this up? They'll be, this will be relevant in a bit. But this example that we have pictured here is an example of a ganglion cell that is on center, meaning that it's turned on when light is shined in its center, off surround, meaning that it's turned off if light is exclusively in the surrounding area and not the center. And that's kind of just reiterated here in text. There's the alternative version. Some other ganglion cells are the opposite, where if they have light only hitting the center, they're turned off. If they have light hitting the surrounding ring, then they're turned on. So this can vary from one ganglion cell to another. There can be on center, off surround cells. There can be off center, on surround cells. But that's assuming that light is coming to a pinpoint or coming in as rings or something weird like that. Let's suppose that things are a lot more ambiguous. If we were to shine a light on the whole thing, where it's shining on the surround and the center equally, what will happen typically is that we'll have the ganglion cell, instead of firing maximum or instead of not firing at all, it'll give like weak responses. So let's depict what that looks like activity-wise here in the next slide. We'll focus on the left-hand side of each of these diagrams. This slide. If we shine a dot of light in the center of the ganglion cell's receptive field, and then we look at the action potentials. The action potentials are illustrated uh, by each vertical red line here. So each red line equals one turning on of the ganglion cell. And where it says light on, that's where in time they turn this light, this dot of light on here. So we notice that even before they turn the light on, this ganglion cell is already having like some few action potentials. So its default state is to kind of give some impulses occasionally. So it has a baseline of firing sometimes. That means that it can either increase from baseline or decrease down to zero. So we have an ability for the firing to go both directions. This allows for a little bit more flexibility in how it can convey information to the brain. All right, getting back on track. We have this on center cell. We have a dot of light shining in the center of it. While the light is active, we see that the firing rate, the amount of times the neuron turns on per second picks up a lot. When the light turns off, it goes back to its normal firing rate. We go right below that here where it stimulates the surround region only in a ring. And we see that it goes from its baseline firing rate of sometimes to nothing while the light is on in this ring form. And so in that case, it decreases the firing rate to nothing. Or to the other diagram on the right here, to the left side of that, if we have it in total darkness, the ganglion cell will actually just be firing its baseline. And that's what I meant by baseline firing rate. When we're not doing any light experiments here, when we're not exposing it to light, this is what the ganglion cell is always doing in the background. It's always firing action potentials occasionally. If we were to flip things around and just expose the whole thing to light, we see that it doesn't look very different from its baseline response. And so when we look at that, we might see maybe a few more action potentials, a few more red vertical lines, but it's hard to tell while the light is on. So the fact is that because in the on center cell, the one in the left side of both these diagrams, because the center turns the ganglion cell on when you activate it with light. 
And because the surround turns the ganglion cell off when you activate it with light, Increase it excessively, it doesn't increase it at all, it just kind of stays the same because they kind of cancel out each other out again. And when we look at the right side of both these diagrams, the off center cell, we basically just get the reverse, where I mentioned how some ganglion cells might be turned off if you shine a light at the center. We see that here. They might be activated when you have a light in a ring around the center, the surround area, and it's activated here. But the two types of ganglion cells become pretty equivalent when they're either shown no light or when they're shown light everywhere. So that's just kind of how these uh, center versus surround receptive fields work in ganglion cells as far as like the nuts and bolts of it. Now, why? Why on earth would it set itself up this way? The eye, the brain, sight in general. Here's a little bit of why. Our eyes can help us detect the edges of things. And so when we have receptive fields of ganglion cells at different spots of vision, so in other words, when we have this picture overlaid from the light coming into our eye, splayed onto the back of the retina, then these center versus surround fields will come into play. Um, one of them that's activated by light in the center might just kind of have weak responses over here. So the top right receptive field might have weak responses because the center and surrounds cancel each other out. Another one where maybe more of the surround is in darkness and a lot more of the center is in light, this might have more activation. Another one over here where there's a little bit of the surround in light and then the rest is in darkness, it might have less activity than baseline. And then we have this other one in darkness here, and this might not be much different from the one in complete light. So really these ones that are on the edge here between the dark spot, the dark area and the light area, these are the ones that are gonna tell the brain, oh, there's an edge here because the firing has changed for these ganglion cells. So wherever in the eye's visual map, uh, these ganglion cells are located, that's gonna tell us where the edge is and it'll tell us exactly how on the edge these different ganglion cells are. Quick trick to play, and some of you have seen this before. Take a moment and tell me what color is square A and what color is square B? After you've taken a moment to figure that out, also answer another question, are they different colors? As some of you have kind of figured out, I'm leading you to a certain answer when you have a feeling like it's not actually as simple as it seems because it isn't. In the case of squares A and B, they're actually the same color and we can only see this once they are directly connected. It is the context that they are in that causes us to perceive them as different colors. So our eyes and our brain are not concerned with absolute brightness of things, but they're more concerned with what their brightness is in the context of their surroundings. So this causes us to look at uh, square B and say, oh, well, that must be lighter color than the surroundings. And that is true. We just don't have squares A and B right next to each other close enough in order to determine that they're actually the same color. We don't have that context that they're both nearby each other. So we could think of vision being actually relative rather than an absolute thing. So vision doesn't just look at luminance of objects, something more um, analytical like a device that measures light, like a photometer. It wouldn't be able to distinguish the difference between a white surface in dim light versus a black surface in bright light. We, however, can. And so, we'll have certain impressions of like what color something's supposed to be. And that's lightness constancy, regardless of what the light bombarding that surface is. The way that retinal ganglion cells, RGCs for short, try to do this is that they figure out the edges of things or they figure out, oh, well, if this retinal ganglion cell is this active, how active is the neighboring one? 
And the brain does the math on this. It tries to figure out, okay, we have a whole bunch of these renal ganglion cells at different spots. What kind of activity is each giving? And what is that telling us about what's being seen? So one thing that Ernst Mach had figured out was that retinal ganglion cells do this interesting thing as far as showing us uh, context or edge detection. So if we're looking at the GIF down here in the bottom left, when the boxes are actually physically touching, the color distinction between them seems a lot more from each other then and the middle boxes seem like they are the same color until they start touching. So that's where when we have a certain context of two colors right next to each other, we can make a comparison. But if they're spread out, then they're not close enough to have that context. Another example here is where we have these lines, static lines vertically here. What'll happen is that because of how ganglion cells are working, it'll almost appear like the vertical lines are not just a solid color. When you look at them closely, when you approach the right edge of each of these blocks, these vertical blocks, it might seem like it's actually getting slightly darker right around the edge here. And then we hop over to the next color band or this mock band, you'll notice that it almost looks like the very left edge of this band is much lighter before you cross into the next color. In other words, it looks like there's a gradient of color rather than just solid colors when we look straight at it. If we look at it from a distance, it might look a little bit more solid, but looking at it up close, it might seem like there's this sort of um, darkening before we cross the new color and then lightening to darkening as we get into the next color. How does that work? Well, what we're actually seeing is not what exactly exists. So when we look at these gradients uh, or these mock bands, these sorts of lines that we see, like this dark line here, this whitish line here, this other dark line here, and this brighter line here, these are not real. The way our eye is seeing them makes it seem like these specific stark lines that exist across a gradient here are actually existing when they don't. So this illusion is caused by the fact that when we have these center versus surround type of receptive fields, what happens is this. The actual reality on paper of what's happening is that we have solid black here, and then when there's a gradient, the brightness of the image slowly slopes up in a straight line. So that's this gradient area. And then we follow the black line further, we get solid white and it just basically is a plateau up here. The way that the um, ganglion cells, the RGCs look at this though, is that, okay, well, an RGC is in the black area. And then as soon as the gradient starts, we'll have a dip in the activity of those ganglion cells. And then as they try to catch up, they'll kind of overshoot up here. So in other words, there'll be a dark edge as we're getting out of a dark area, like it'll perceive it as excessively dark. And then as we're getting into a lighter area, it'll perceive it as excessively light. So we call this an illusion basically, because the eye is trying to make sense of these edges when there's a gradient. And again, just for people who aren't clear about the term gradient, it's when instead of there being a solid separation of black and white, it's more like increasingly lightening shades of gray from really dark, dark gray to really light, light gray. That's a gradient. All right, so that's all mock band stuff. I think this is probably a good spot to take maybe a five minute break if you need to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, stop this recording here for now.